Before we get to questions, Fred, I know you have an interesting sample and we have supplemental pictures for this one. So what'd you bring tonight? Well, it, it's sort of like a club here. Uh, <laughs> this, this is a mulberry and it's been infested by borers. And you know, now's a good time to be thinking about borer control in many of your trees and we'll get to that in a minute. Let me show you this specimen. It's in mulberry and we're seeing all these little holes. And these were caused by one of the more common borers that we have in Nebraska called the red-headed ash bore mm -hmm. and I have some here let me just show you them I've got a live one too that came out of this that we'll show but you know they're they're fairly small maybe a half an inch in length uh, they have but they have uh, the here we go you know you can see the bands across the back and this is only about a half an inch long so they aren't large but they're one of the more common bores that we have in many trees we see them in our ash trees uh, in our oak trees uh, and again in mulberry and, and many of the other ones and generally when we first know that they're there we may see some die back in the trees but we see all these holes and these are the emergence holes uh, that, that uh, the, as the beetle is coming out, a beetle is going to be finding cracks and crevices in that tree, laying eggs, and starting the cycle again. So the way we're going to do that is that we're going to put down a residual spray on those trees we need to protect. Okay. Uh, something like permethrin or bifenthrin would work really quite well to control the borers. And again, we'll come back, I think, to this in a few minutes, and I'll, I'll try to dig out my little critter here uh, that isn't being very cooperative, but uh, I right. actually have a live one, so. Good, thanks, Fred. All right, Lowell, you have a weed of the week, maybe? Yeah, so <laughs> we talk about this each year. Um, we always get questions on this. It seems like a plant that um, has kind of been on the increase in, in the last four or five years, and this happens to be uh, poison hemlock. And you can see the tap root uh, on the plant there. I'll set this down, and um, you can see the uh, lacy leaf uh, here. It's in the uh, uh, carrot or parsley or parsley family, and a lot of people uh, mistake it for an edible green, or they they might mistake it for an edible green out there. And this is actually a, a poisonous plant, and you don't want to eat it. Um, one of the key things on this is uh, the purple speckling uh, that you can see on the stems uh, becomes much more obvious as the as the plant gets bigger and, and matures. But it's a it's a biennial plant. Uh, if you see them uh, in this stage, uh, it was there last year. Uh, and the best time for control, if you're going to spray this with a chemical to try to get rid of it, uh, such as 2,4-D or dicamba, is with fall application. Same time that you're trying to control dandelions is an excellent time to uh, control uh, poison hemlock. Excellent. Thank you so much. Kevin, you have uh, sort of an interesting creature there for your rotter spot. I do, I do. Um, this odd looking um, lilac uh, is suffering from a genetic disorder that we call fasciation. And fasciation is very interesting. So it occurs in the apical meristem, so uh, in the growing point of the plant. And that apical meristem is usually circular, and so it produces circular stems. Um, well, something occurs in the plant that scientists haven't really figured out yet, um, and it causes that meristem to become flattened. So all of the stems produced from that particular meristem um, have this flattened appearance. And you'll see this in woody plants. You'll see it in herba er herbaceous perennials and annual annuals. Um, there's actually a very small market for plants that have this genetic disorder, uh, which is good because um, this particular dysfunction can be passed on um, from generation to generation vegetatively through pop propagules and by seed. So it's not a disease, it's a genetic disorder. Um, researchers and scientists have been able to uh, reproduce these kind of symptoms by causing physical damage to that meristem region and by injecting certain um, plant hormones. So. It is something that the plant does on its own. It's kind of, what'd you say, Kim? It's the plant version of three-legged frog or four, five-legged frog or whatever. <laughs> so kind of uh, interesting looking. It doesn't, uh, it's not gonna result in the death of the plant. It just might be unsightly. If you don't like flat stems, uh, you can prune it out and um, the rest of the plant should be unaffected. Thank you, Kevin. And I think, Elizabeth, you were talking about a willow called fantail willow. It's a fantail willow used in the cut floral yeah. industry, and um, like Kevin said, there's a niche market for some of those crops. Excellent, and you've brought us something not so pretty based on our weather, I believe. I did bring some things not so pretty. Now, believe it or not, these tulips have had a hard year already. Um, they have been through snow. They have been through grapple, which is the fine classification of weather between sleet and hail, which is really small hail. 
Um, it was so thick they had to get the snow plows out to move it. Wow. And then it went through frost. So these little tulips have been through a lot. I know they look really unsightly, um, but for the overall health of the plant, you want to leave this foliage on as long as possible. So that way that bulb and those leaves can photosynthesize, you get that energy back into the bulb. And so for next year, if these buds don't happen to bloom and, and be pretty, next year the bulb will have enough energy so that it can produce some pretty flowers. So I know they're unsightly, I know they don't look very nice, but go ahead and let the foliage stand as long as possible till they start to naturally yellow and then they can be removed. Uh, good advice, Elizabeth. We, all across the state, I'm afraid, we have bulbs that got damaged a little bit. What all a right. strange year. It is a really strange year. That's what we said last year, remember? I know it. <laughs> yeah, snowing last week and 70 this week. All right, Fred, I believe the first uh, set of pictures is for yours this evening. And okay. this is, um, again, we're, we're kind of in a dearth of insects, but we have a question about sawfly treatment and whether it is time to have that happen and with what and yep. which pines actually get pine sawfly damage. Well, there's a sawfly that goes after all the different pines okay. and spruce, I mean, so, but the most common is the one we find on our scotch pine. Uh, it'll sometimes go to white and, and that's a European sawfly and that's one that we're seeing uh, in this image right here. And normally we would be right in the middle of pine sawfly season. I went out and checked my landscape and I'm a little out of town so it's a little cooler. And again, there weren't even any eggs laid. There weren't any adult wasps around the sawflies. So we're a little bit, a little early, but again, a few warm days, the, the flies will come out, they'll lay their eggs, the wasp, not the flies, the, the wasps, sawfly wasps. So again, it's time to start looking, and again, what we're gonna look for first is right at the tips of the scotch pine, that little, little brown patch of needles that look kind of shriveled, and then you'll find those small caterpillars, the, the larvae, uh, feeding in there, uh, and then that's when you have to decide if there's enough to take action. Remember, uh, I've said before that because they can't, uh, once once you've knocked these saw, these saw flies off, uh, they can't get back up. So what I do is actually when I'm driving around on my tractor doing mowing, if I see a little group of them, I just knock them off. I carry a little stick and, I t -t 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 and tap them off, they drop down and they're gone. But because they're, they're actually wasps, they're very easy to control with insecticides. Anything, permethrin or seven, uh, would, uh, even neem oil would control them quite nicely. All right, so. thanks Fred. Sometimes the weather is good for us, so we don't yeah. necessarily and, and, get... You know, and again, insects. this year, you never know what's going We may not have a problem. There you go. Yes, we All right. Will. Yeah, we will. <laughs> okay, all right. Lowell, you get the next uh, picture. Okay. And this is a viewer who wants to know what this grassy, they think it's a grassy, weedy looking thing is. Uh, and what is it, how and when do they control it? Yeah, if, you, if folks uh, look close at the seed head in there, uh, that's, kind of, that's kind of the giveaway on this is uh, folks might confuse it with crabgrass, but this is actually uh, goosegrass is, is what this is. It's uh, summer annual grass. It tends to be a real problem in highly managed turf uh, areas, uh, closely mown golf courses, sports turf, um, those types of areas because it's a plant that can really, really withstand very low mowing uh, as well. And it, it looks pretty unsightly uh, in uh, sports turf or, or golf course uh, types of situations. Um, pre if folks are, uh, have this and they want to uh, get rid of it, um, or uh, I, I guess try to control it. Pre-emergence applications, probably multiple uh, app or sequential applications with the same um, herbicides that we would use for crabgrass uh, would also be effective on, on, on goosegrass. All right, thank you, Lowell. All right, your turn, Kevin. And this is a, this is a question that we, uh, we're all concerned across the country about, actually. Uh, and it is downy mildew in impatience, mm -hmm. which of course is one of our best <laughs> annuals that will flower in the shade. The, the question is whether we have it in Nebraska or what's going on here. Yeah, I haven't seen any in the clinic and I haven't heard any reports of, of this particular um, disease in Nebraska. It's uh, so far confined to the eastern states um, from, from what I can find out. Um, it is, it can be a, a really nasty um, disease 
right now we have perfect temperatures too. It, it likes the cooler and the wetter environments. Um, so even though we haven't seen it, it is a possibility that it might show up. Um, as the pictures are showing here, um, you can uh, the, the, the disease will progress. Uh, it'll start out as yellow spots on the upper side of the leaf surface. And if you turn that leaf over, you'll see, like you saw in those pictures, the white fuzz underneath it. And that's a good sign that you have downy mildew. Um, you know, there is a risk of it coming in through our nurseries, but we do, um, you know, we, we check all of our nursery stock for these kind of things. So we'll hopefully prevent it from entering into our landscapes. So okay. isn't here yet, but we need to be on the lookout. Good. And I do understand that I think the New Guineas are, are resistant. <laughs> so we'll, we'll hope that that holds true. All right, Elizabeth, this is a fun question. This is a viewer who actually sent us this question from the United Kingdom. And it's appropriate because he's talking about a plant called cordyline, which we use here as a container plant, not hardy. Uh, he lost his to the ground in the very heavy frost, but then it's coming back up again. And he wants to know whether he can go ahead and, and do some division on that and create some more just in case. All I can say is I wish I could grow some outside <laughs> right. and I'm kind of jealous. Um, but what he can do with that plant is you can um, propagate them and divide them apart. You want to be fairly careful. You want to try to tease those roots apart if at all possible. And if you can't quite get them apart, use a sharp uh, spade to kind of help to cut them apart. Um, but yep, go ahead, multiply, pull them apart and sprinkle them through the landscape. Excellent. And we it's really fun to hear from around the world for yeah. our show. All right, your turn for another picture, Fred. Okay. This is actually somebody who had these on the <clears throat> red oak last year. Okay. And um, <clears throat> they wondered yes. what they are. And there might be a little rotty, spotty stuff in there, Kevin, too. And, but they're wondering how to, what to treat them with. Oh, well, th those, are, those are galls. Uh, and those are caused by an insect, uh, probably a, a wasp called a sinipid wasp or a gall wasp, and they're absolutely harmless on the tree, you know, unless they're extremely abundant. I mean, this is truly all part of nature's wondrous pageantry, all right? <laughs> they're, they're, they're really so cool because that little wasp larva takes over the uh, physiological machinery of the plant and makes that leaf, makes the tree grow its home. Uh, and of course, so people, folks that are involved in tumor research and cancer research are all very interested in these gall-forming insects. And they can be uh, wasps, uh, like hymenoptera, or they can be flies uh, or aphids. Uh, there are many different kinds of insects that produce these galls, but they're, they're harmless. Uh, if they were very, very abundant, the time to treat would be just as the leaves are expanding in the spring. But that's not something, certainly at that those numbers, enjoy them. I mean, they're, they're, they're really cool. Yeah, that's the first Nature's Wonders pageantry comment <laughs> we've had this year. The season. <laughs> okay, uh, Lowell, this is not so wondrous, this okay. pageantry. This is, um, <laughs> this is a question about non-target herbicide damage. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we have a couple of images here. Wh what should people do about using these particular herbicides in, in a landscape? And what should they tell people or, you know, what are the issues here? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, it's, it's a common complaint every year. We, folks use uh, herbicides to control weeds and uh, occasionally, um, uh, sometimes or maybe more often than, than it should, uh, herbicides move off-site uh, due to physical drift or um, uh, high temperatures cause volatilization and herbicides move um, uh, kind of uh, randomly um, or with with air currents uh, at that point in time. Uh, the big things are to if folks are using a like a handheld sprayer, and a lot of times the uh, the pump uh, to increase pressure, people like to really pump those up, and that's that's really not a good idea because what it does is it creates smaller driftable droplets uh, out there, more prone to offsite movement. So keep pressures low. Of, uh, is is one thing, and then avoiding very very hot times or the hottest times of the day to make applications, um, especially if they're using 2,4-D or dicamba, uh, you know, is is probably good practice uh, out there right. to try to mi minimize that that type of injury. And and hope their neighbors don't get a little overzealous. Yes. Yes. All right. All right, Kevin, you have the next image. <laughs> Uh, and, and this is actually somebody who has mushrooms, shrooms coming up in their lawn where they, um, they had a big tree removed yep. and they've had mushrooms coming up 
from where the roots are rotting. They get worse every year. They want to know uh, how to get rid of them or at least control them. Yeah, well, unfortunately, the only thing you can really do is remove the stump to keep, to keep them from, from growing. As, as long as that, uh, that woody material is in the soil and decomposing, um, those, those fungi are going to be there um, and produce those basidiocarps. Um, you know, get rid of the stump if you can. Um, if you can't, you know, you can just mow them off or pull them off. Um, it, it's, you know, sometimes they can be poisonous. Um, so if you have children or dogs or something like that, um, you want to stay on top of it, you can just mow right over them. Um, unfortunately, um, fungicides aren't very effective in controlling um, these particular types of, of fungal blooms. And you might see them associated with um, tree trunks like that or in semicircles or full circles in the lawn. That's something we call fairy ring. Mm -hmm. Again, um, you can just physically remove those. They're called basidiocarps, the fungal caps. Um, and that's about really the only method. All right, thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Elizabeth says use a golf club. Golf club right? Practice your swing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you get a picture on that one, Elizabeth. This is a viewer who actually has an ID question. She sent us an image uh, of, the, of the interesting paired thorns, and um, she couldn't find out what it was, but we know. Mm -hmm. And we have some other images to go with it to remind people how beautiful this thing actually is as well. It, it can be beautiful. What it is, is it's a black locust, um, Robidia pseudoacacia. Um, there's your Latin for the night. Um, it can be a very lovely tree, especially when it's in bloom. You have these long white blooms. Um, they just looks, they just look gorgeous. They stream down. Um, in the spring, um, there's a purple one um, called, I believe, purple robe um, mm -hmm. that's out there. It does have some downsides, um, one of which is the thorns. Another one happens to be that it does tend to spread and sprout, and right. so it'll colonize. Um, so those are some downsides to it. It's also in the bean family, so you can get those long bean pods too, um, but it is a very beautiful tree in the spring. In the right location, it'll work out really well. Right. Okay, we have a question for you, Fred. Actually, it's, a, it's kind of a double question. Uh, this is a viewer in Omaha who, is, uh, who wants to use merit in their lindens to control the Japanese beetles, okay. but has, has read online a story concerning merit being translocated to the pollen and resulting in the death of bees. And then we have from Facebook a question about herbicides being harmful or dangerous to honeybees. Herbicides? So, mm-hmm. We'll, we'll let uh, herbicides we'll let do that. Yeah. Do that yeah. one. You yeah. know, generally herbicides are not toxic. This, right. There's some yeah. notable right. exceptions, but generally herbicides are not toxic to right. insects. Right. Right. Okay. So, you know, merit is is this a powerful systemic? You apply it to the foliage, or you apply it to the roots, and it's taken up by the plant. And so there's always a concern that it's going to go into the flowers where the bees are collecting pollen and nectar. But you know that really hasn't turned out to be the case. Uh, generally. Uh, it, it goes into the foliage and not into the reproductive parts of the plant. We can use it on, in fruit orchards because it doesn't go into the apples or the pears. And so it's, uh, uh, it's so again, it's labeled for, for fruit and for certain types of vegetables. So I think it, it would be fine to control boars and other, other insects. Okay. I wouldn't worry about the honeybees. All right, thanks, Fred. I, I wouldn't worry about the herbicide aspect yeah. of that uh, either. I mean, the herbicide may get rid of the plant they want to forage on or, or use, but there's plenty of other plants in the landscape for them to, okay. to survive on. All right, thanks, Lowell. You have a wild strawberry question. Oh, boy. <laughs> We've been waiting for that all night. <laughs> which is how to control them in a large flower bed. Ooh, uh, in, in a large flower bed, that's um, that's significantly more difficult. Uh, in a turf situation, you can use growth regulator herbicides, but I, I don't know of any selective way to remove strawberries from a uh, from a from another broadleaf crop or desirable uh, broadleaf crop. So that pretty much leaves hand pulling and mechanical tools uh, there. Un unfortunately, that's the reality of it. Enjoy the sunshine and pull them up. Yep. <laughs> All right, Kevin, uh, we've had a couple peach tree questions, but they're pretty much not flowering yet. Mm -hmm. So controlling scab or black spot or those kinds of diseases, how, how do we do that and when? Um, well, um, you know, the best thing to do is, is if you have a history of scab on your peaches is to manage the residues, the leaves that fall, any fruits that fall to the ground in the, in the fall, 
remove them. Um, there are fungicides that are available uh, for protection and they need to start, uh, application needs to start when the flower bl blossoms start falling off the tree and they continue at two week intervals until you know fruit set and harvest. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any product names available, but there are fungicides available for that uh, for control. But if you're not trying to market your peaches or your apples, because this is the same kind of a problem in apples as well, apple scab and spots on apples, um, scab is a superficial wound so you peel back the skin and a little bit of the flesh and, and the scab is gone they're still edible uh, maybe just not marketable or you eat them in the dark or you mm -hmm. eat them in the dark <laughs> okay. all right elizabeth you have a bankelman question this came mm -hmm. in on facebook um, the red buds budded before the cold weathers they don't really say whether they actually broke with the flowers but they now look black so the question is whether they will recover and flower um, if the flowers were out and the buds were out and the buds are black, more than likely they got hit by the, the frost and the cold temperatures and they're probably not going to, to rebud this year. The good news is, is the flower buds come out first, um, so the leaf buds and the leaves are still probably going to be okay. Um, just look at the tree, um, watch it to see how it leaves out, um, but all you can really do is wait and see, but unfortunately those blooms are probably done for. We're going to go to another set of pictures. Fred, we're going to start with you. Um, this is a viewer from Webster County, and um, they have holes in their cedar trees oh. and the apple trees, and they wonder if it's a problem, and they wonder what to do about it. Last year, they lost an apple tree. They don't know that this was actually the problem with that. Well, that, that looks like... I'm not an ornithologist, that sure looks like sapsucker damage. It's right. kind of woodpecker. Right. And what they feed them, what you see is a parallel, is a line, so they will feed them, move, just keep moving around. Mm -hmm. And they can effectively girdle the, the trunk of those trees, a small tree like that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the upper canopy must be looking pretty sad with that much damage. And are and, they after insects? They are after insects, or they, they think that there's insects in there. You know, some of them may not be quite so bright. And anyway, but. <laughs> I mean, I've seen sapsucker damage, and there's nothing there. I have yeah. no idea what they're digging for, but right. they think they are. Yeah. So I, I really don't know. I suppose you could put something around the base of the tree uh, just to keep the uh, hardware cloth, to keep the uh, sapsuckers from uh, probing in there just until it healed. Mm -hmm. Sounds to me like it's an insect question for you and a critter question when Dennis is here. When Dennis not. is here. Dennis probably knows exactly what He'd to do. He'd probably say the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks, Fred. All right, this is another grassy weed issue. Yes. Western Nebraska viewer, <clears throat> and they're having a problem with windmill grass encroaching into the edge of a bluegrass lawn. They want to know how they can get rid of the windmill without ruining the bluegrass. And I think you have both a sample, and we have a picture of this as well. Yeah, uh, t tumble windmill grass is one of those grasses that we've uh, had received a, a number of questions on uh, the last few years. It has thick, wiry stolons that, that I'm holding uh, right here. I know there's a few patches in, in Lincoln here that I, I went out to today and, and collected some. Uh, it's a warm season grass, so uh, right now it, it looks very much dead uh, right now. But if you pull some of it up and you look really close, some of the green tissue is just starting to uh, come out on it. But it would be too early right now to make a herbicide application. Uh, what we typically recommend is uh, the use of uh, tenacity. Um, th uh, multiple applications, sequential applications, uh, up to three times uh, spaced uh, two to three weeks apart uh, for uh, for satisfactory control. And uh, that being said, uh, you know, each year you probably have to uh, look at it for, to determine if, if uh, repeat applications are, are needed uh, out there. It, interestingly, it's one of those uh, grass species that Roundup uh, isn't really all that effective mm -hmm. on. Um, tenacity is, is a better way to go uh, on this plant. All right, I still think it's pretty when it's in windmill. Form. Yeah, and it's, it's a really big, showy, uh, it kind of looks like a, like a crabgrass on, on steroids almost, but, but yeah. Fireworks, it looks yeah. like fireworks. All right, Kevin, um, you have a viewer who sent us an image of an orchid, uh, and, and um, the, the species is falcata on this one. It's a little tricky to see, but there are some spots on the, on the, on the broad foliage of that, and um, they've, she's had this for about two years and is wondering what that is potentially. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, leaf spots on orchids can uh, occur as a result of cold temperatures. If maybe she had it close to the window during the winter and it, it, it leaned up against the window and actually made contact with the cold window, that can cause that. Otherwise, um, there are some, some foliar fungal pathogens that could be responsible. It is diff difficult, you know, via picture to, to pinpoint the actual cause. But um, what the viewer can do, though, is um, just take a cotton ball and some peroxide and gently wipe the spots. Peroxide will dissolve into water and oxygen so you don't need to rinse the plant after that. But uh, if it is um, being caused by a fungus, it's a possibility to slow down um, the progression mm. by using really? peroxide. Mm. Cool. Interesting. All sorts of things to do with peroxide, including blonde your hair. <laughs> 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 or, not. or not. Okay, Elizabeth, you have uh, a very interesting question as well. This is a viewer in Nebraska City. They uh, apparently have an azalea that was planted five years ago in a location that's no longer suitable. They want to know how to transplant. And for our viewers, that's what they look like in the right location. That would be in Maxwell Arboretum here on campus. So they didn't send us a picture of this one, but it is five years old. It's going to be fairly difficult. Azaleas aren't one of the ones that likes to transplant very well, um, and it's going to be difficult to move it. Also, it kind of likes those acidic soils, really protected, um, so it has to have the right location for it. Um, you can try to move it, um, but right now, but you know, keep in mind that it, it's not one of the ones that transplants very well. All right, so uh, Fred, we're gonna, we're gonna go to a very interesting question for you. All right. This is a viewer who saw this on their concolor fur. Oh. And they wonder, is that egg masses? Is that an insect of some sort? What is that? Oh no, that's, that's, part, of, that's part of the plant. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're the male Flowers, correct? Or is, as it were? Not really. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not to use that word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Basically, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're conifers. Conifers. So they don't technically flower. flower but, but none of us can remember the word. <laughs> so, so, no, nothing wrong, it's right? It's not an insect. Nope. Those are perfectly natural. All right. And, and very. And cool. Cool. Pretty. Very cool. Attractive. Very beautiful. All right, Lowell, you yes. have something also very beautiful, but <clears throat> not very controllable. Okay. This is, um, this is actually a couple of viewers who have asked us about this. This is one from Malmo, uh, who has Star of Bethlehem in their lawn and perennial yep. beds. Um, looks like an onion, has it? She, yep. she has fescue and buffalo. Apparently it's gone everywhere. How does she control it? Well, it, it is a perennial, uh, and that's what, part of what makes it so difficult to control. Um, if, if the viewer wants to take a herbicide uh, or chemical approach to that, uh, repeated applications of uh, a growth regulator, 2,4-D, um, can be uh, somewhat effective. Uh, you have to be persistent uh, with that. Um, otherwise, if, if it's just in little spots, you could also uh, dig them out uh, to, to control it if you don't want to use uh, chemical methods. But it's just one that's, that's very, very uh, difficult because it ha it's very spindly uh, mm -hmm. leaves. It's very difficult to get a, a good amount of herbicide uh, on the plant to take up to try to control it. Mm -hmm. I know we have it all over in our neighborhood yeah. in kind of yeah. that strip. And I gave up and pretty, enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. I do too. <laughs> I do too. All right, uh, Kevin, this is uh, yet more issues with spruce. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a viewer in rural Brainerd that has a tree. This tree was actually relocated about five years ago. It was doing fine out on a remote area of the acreage. So it's potentially some drought associated maybe, but they did water last year. Okay. Trimmed all the brown tips, but but then you've got all this stuff going on. So, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, you know, most likely um, it is drought stress or winter injury or heat stress. Um, the thing that's happening is that we, we're having a lot of spruce or evergreen trees die because of this, you know, lack of water, and people are having trees die who watered. Um, supplemental watering last summer in some cases wasn't enough. But what's happening now is that these trees um, are, uh, if, this isn't the correct word, but they're kind of immunocompromised. They don't have any defenses. They're very sick. They're very sad. They have a lack of water and now they're very susceptible to um, some of the fungi, uh, the plant pathogenic fungi that are, that are, are going to be present this coming year. Um, 
So the key thing to do with our spruce trees is to prune out and remove all of the dead um, parts or plants if the entire tree is dead. Um, we had this very cool and wet spring, so we might anticipate some spruce spider mite damage. Yep. Um, you want to yep. you want to yep. scout, scout your trees. Uh, look for webbing. Um, stick a piece of uh, white paper underneath a, a branch and whack it with a stick, and, and see if there's any insects that fall down. Small, very small insects that fall down onto that white sheet of paper. That's possibly the spruce spider mite. Um, but again, I think cause of death was probably just drought. We just want to make sure we clean up the trees to prevent any more uh, pest or disease inf infestations and infections. All right, thank you, Kevin. Well, Elizabeth, you have a question about whether, uh, what can be done about construction soils and whether in fact it is too wet. So you have started with a sample of, is it too wet? <laughs> um, and this was out of the backyard farmer garden and I just took it out of the cup. The top was a little bit dry, but it is extremely wet. Um, this has quite a bit of sand in it and it can ribbon it fairly well. It's sticky, it's really wet. So this wouldn't be a good time to be out and working in the garden right now or tilling it up. Um, you're just gonna cause some issues with your soil structure later on down the road. When it comes to construction soils, um, if you're able to add some amendments, like some compost and things like that into it, that's gonna help your soil structure out. You need to be fairly careful if you have a heavy clay soil. Um, and the reason for that is if you were to add some compost, maybe you think you should add some sand. Um, when you add clay and sand, you get concrete. <laughs> So be careful um, if you're going to add some amendments with your clay soils, you know, think about some compost. We're looking at about a 5% organic matter as being optimal for that. And like I said, this weekend, um, check how wet your soils are before you go out and try to play in the dirt. All right, so we have a handful of questions left. Um, let's see, Fred, let's start with this one. This is a, a viewer who over the weekend determined that something has been gnawing on their lilac tree and they wonder what it might be, maybe a critter, but do you want to talk a little bit about boars in lilac yeah, right I mean, now? Yeah, you know, now would be the time to be looking for that. But I mean, you know, again, things like s squirrels or rabbits, particularly bunnies, they'll chew on anything. You know, anything that's, you know, something like a lilac tree would be perfect for, for young rabbits. Uh, so, yeah, I always protect all the, the trunks of my small, until I get to about inch and a half caliper. But right now is the time, you know, in your lilacs to be looking for boars. So go down to the bottom of the canes, look for holes, sawdusty material as that adult boar has, is coming out. Uh, it, it, it leaves a little pile of sawdust. And if that's the case, you might want to go to a, a boar treatment. You know, that goes on the first of May, I mean, middle of May, a couple of additional applications 10 days apart. I like permethrin, uh, eight if from the Euro May product or uh, bifenthrin, again, any of those. You want to spray from the, you know, the bottom third of, of the canes and if it's concentrate around the crown of the, of the plant, that's where the boars are. All right. Thanks, Fred. Uh, we have a Facebook question, Lowell, that is, um, what is the difference between 2,4-D and Roundup? Okay, uh, they're, they are two different herbicides. 2,4-D um, is a broadleaf herbicide. Uh, it can be used on grasses and generally does not kill or harm grasses and selectively takes broadleaf uh, weeds out of turf and undesirable areas. Uh, Roundup, on the other hand, is uh, broad spectrum. It will control both grasses and broadleaves. And we quite often get pictures in during the summer of somebody thought that they were uh, gonna spray some dandelions in their lawn. They used Roundup and of course they controlled the dandelion and the turf uh, there. Just the, the biggest thing is to uh, remember that uh, Roundup uh, kills both grasses and broadleaves. 2,4-D only controls broadleaves. Thank you, Lowell. Uh, we have time for one quick question, Kevin and Elizabeth, which would be, this is a viewer in Lincoln who has a 40 to 50 year old pin oak that has spongy roots on one side twisty on the others, it, what would be going on with spongy roots and how do they know when it's time to cut her down? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess I don't know, you know, okay. spongy, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure yeah. if, 
the, the overall health of the tree, if you look at the tree um, that might be having the spongy roots on it, if you look at the leaves, if the leaves are smaller than normal, if they're really uh, malformed, um, if the tree's maybe not leafing out as what it once did, those are some signals that the tree could be stressed. Also, you're thinking of, okay, premature leaf drop is another one that could potentially be an issue with that. So that's the overall health of the tree just to, to watch. Okay. Um, of course, iron deficiency is the, is the mm -hmm. biggest killer of our pin oaks and um, of course that's a soil pH issue um, not, an, not an actual iron availability issue um, but that's you know I, I don't know if that compromises the roots and makes them spongy nope. but nope. so we have uh, unfortunately no more time to talk about that pin oak <laughs> but it's probably an old one <laughs>